Hi, everyone. I'm Winnie um, from the authors at Google team. So it's my pleasure to introduce Rick. Um, he is the best-selling author of o over 40 travel books. He's hosted over 100 shows on public television and radio. Um, we all love him, and that's why you guys are all here. So he's going to share with us his tips on traveling to Europe, how to pack smart, uh, how to avoid scams, eat well while we're traveling, and all that stuff, stretch our dollar, all the things that would be great for us to know traveling on business or for ourselves. So without further ado, let's welcome Rick Steves, the advocate of smart and independent, independent travel. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It's, it's great to be here, and uh, the challenge for me will be to distill uh, all of the things I've learned from 30 years of traveling in Europe into 50 minutes, okay? <laughs> and have a little time for Q&A. So, uh, but thanks for having me here. And uh, let me just quickly, if I can just grab these four things. Yep, this. I'll give it back, yeah, because <laughs> I understand these were snapped up by the early birds, I guess, but I sent down a bunch of these things, and you can get all this stuff on the uh, internet, but uh, I like to still have stuff in print. Um, but uh, what we've got here is, uh, this is a 64-page newsletter which highlights our favorite destinations, and that's basically our catalog. Um, I love to give people a map that locates all the hard-to-find places that don't show up on normal maps, because that's what my job is, to find those quirky little odd spots. So it's frustrating because you don't see it on a regular map. You can see it on, on this map. And uh, just at lunch we were talking about how we can also see it on Google Earth uh, in the near future, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, this is just a fun little um, personalized planning map. So those of you who got this, I hope that's helpful for you. I also had the great experience of being in Iran as part of my work as a teacher and a tour guide to bring home a better understanding of Iran. And that's a different talk than what today's topic is. But if you uh, are curious about my Iran show, have any of you seen my Iran show on, on PBS? Uh, you can see it on Hulu.com. We've got it there anytime you like. And it's just uh, really a, an eye-opener for a lot of Americans. But I wanted people to have this uh, print version of my blog there. So uh, if you missed that, obviously, you can get it on my website. But I'm glad that I was able to hand out some of these. And this bigger brochure explains our tour program. There's a DVD in here that gives you a rundown on what we do with the uh, 10,000 people we take to Europe every summer on 20 different itineraries. Okay, um, I'm just going to kind of whip through here, and I, when I think about this talk, it's the same talk I've been giving since I was a college kid back in the 70s, and um, it's more fundamental philosophy of travel than specific, you know, what does this rail pass cost or something like that, because really fundamental is knowing how to travel in a way that you have the best experience. We Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world, and our dollar is sort of in the tank, right? <laughs> so two important things, time and money are very precious, and you've got to use them smartly. Well, if somebody's saying, where's the best deal in Europe? If I said Portugal is really cheap and your travel dreams are taking you to Ireland, the best deal is in Ireland. Travel smart in Ireland. Don't go where it's cheap. You want to go to Ireland or wherever. One thing that carbonates your experience is to meet people and to travel in a way where you're part of the party instead of the part of the economy. And all over Europe, you've got these charming people that just do what they do with gusto. It's so much fun, isn't it, when you, when you work with people that really have found their niche. And when you're traveling, you connect with people who have found their niche. You don't need to be rich to enjoy the highlights, the cultural and artistic and natural wonders of Europe. That's a beautiful thing. But you've got to be able to get away from the marketing stuff that brings you and all the other tourists together. Anybody can enjoy a fine meal in Europe for a, an, a remarkably uh, reasonable price if they are not attracted to the biggest neon sign that brags, we speak English and accept visa cards. <laughs> Okay, you need to go where the locals are going. That's kind of common sense. What I like to do is find these sort of places, back doors, places that are hard to get to a lot of cases, that are not built up for the tourism, but when you get there, you feel like you've really arrived. This is a magic moment. Now, this particular town, Civita di Bonareggio, is, uh, it doesn't matter in this talk, because there's towns like that all over Europe. The key is for you to find those magical places where when you go up that donkey path, you find yourself in a different world. 2009, 2010, you can have that experience if you know where to go. The typical American doesn't know where to go. I was just in Dubrovnik a couple months ago filming. I stepped out of the hotel, sunny day, great, we're going to get some great footage. I look at the main street, human traffic jam, cruise people. All the cruise people came at the same time. All of these thousands of people inundating the city, they're having a, if they're having a good time, it's because they're clueless. I mean, it is just... <laughs> That's not Dubrovnik. They traveled all the way around the world to see it completely. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like Disneyland on a busy day. And uh, I just said, put the camera down. We're, we're not going to shoot this stuff. I just, and then, you know, that afternoon, the people went back to their boats, and Dubrovnik was a joy once again. So we need to travel in a way where we, we do the famous things, you know. 
we, I'm not, I, of course, you got to check out the Acropolis, and I love the windmills and the wooden shoes. <laughs> but what gives your trip that extra dimension is to find what I call the back doors, right? The back doors. This is the book that I wrote as a college kid uh, from just the lecture of my class I was giving at the University of Washington. Now it's in its 30th edition. Spend four months a year every year updating this thing. And the back half of this book are individual chapters on my 40 favorite discoveries, those back doors. But you want to see Paris, you want to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and then you want to go two hours away and hang out in Vernazza on the Cinque Terre. Or you want to go to Salzburg. Salzburg's great, but don't go to Salzburg and complain about tourist crowds. <laughs> it's inundated with tourists. It's great, and it is touristy, accept that. Too many people go to Salzburg, complain about the tourist crowds, and the next morning they take the Sound of Music bus tour. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's fun, but that's not, that's not Austrian. You're going to be rolling through the foothills of the Alps singing Doa Deer with 40 <laughs> Japanese tourists, you know? It's a, that's fun, but you don't go to Austria for that, I don't think. So enjoy Salzburg, enjoy the Sound of Music Tour, enjoy the tourist crowds, and then don't complain about the crowds, but go two hours south to Hallstatt. And then you're communing with nature in a gorgeous little town surrounded by the Alps. All these little towns I talk about are easy to fall through the cracks. Big towns, beautifully preserved with lots of great art, are going to be touristy. Uh, they're going to be, you know, this is a big industry. It's the number one employer and economy in most of those countries. Uh, we don't veto a place because it's got tourist crowds, but we think about enjoying it in a way that minimizes those crowds. As a tour operator, we take all these people on 20 different itineraries all around Europe. You've got to go to Mont Saint-Michel. You've got to go to Rotenburg. You've got to go to Carcassonne and Stratford and Bruges and Toledo. But you don't have to go there when all the tourists are there. You see, we spend the night. We arrive at 4 o'clock just when the tour groups are taken off, have three hours of sightseeing, a nice dinner, a little romantic time on the ramparts, a good night's sleep, a few hours of free time in the morning, and then we're out of there before the place becomes uh, a, a big zoo again. So I really like, this is Toledo here. Uh, it's the historic and spiritual and artistic capital of Spain. It's an incredible place, mobbed by tourists in the middle of the day, all years after hours. Most of the tour groups are staying one hour north in the pr predictable plumbing of the high-rise hotels in the nearby big city. Tour operators, you got to know how they work, and they work to make money. Their initial cost is a giveaway cost, and they make money off of you by selling you optional tours. If they paid too much to sleep right where the action is, nobody would pay $50 tomorrow for the optional tour to go there. They pay less money to stay outside of town, way outside of town, in a hotel that needs to have a price to gather people. And then there's no way to get here but to take the optional tour. That's 50 people times $50. That's $2,500 of gravy for the tour company. Do you see what I mean? That's the kind of thinking you've got to do in order to take a tour and take advantage of it so it doesn't take advantage of you if you're going to take a tour rather than go independently. This is Rotenburg on Der Tauber. If you've been to Germany, you've probably been to Rotenburg. It's the greatest little medieval town in Germany. Again, packed out in the middle of the day, all years at night. Uh, so I like to spend the night in these towns. Venice, infamous for being crowded. It's never crowded early or late. It's rush hour. In the morning, you watch the, the Vaporettos coming in and all the tenders from the cruise ships. The Vaporettos are just packed with boats coming in in the morning, and the ones going the other direction are empty. It's just like rush hour here. At night, those same boats are, it's a flip-flop thing. So just be around early or late. Have a hotel right downtown. Take advantage of those magic hours when you don't have the crowds, and Venice is all yours. Now, I think it's really important for us to remember that Europe is not wearing lederhosen and sitting on a stump and yodeling, okay? <laughs> Those days are gone. Europe is a no-nonsense, futuristic, lean and mean business machine cooking up all sorts of stuff to compete with us here in the United States. Uh, it's a futuristic place. It's a high-powered, energetic business machine. Germany is the size of Montana with un one-third the population and one-third the industrial capacity of our entire country. Uh, now, 20, 30 years ago, this was the Berlin Wall right there. You could get killed for crossing that street. Today, not a hint of the Berlin Wall except for Americans looking for Checkpoint Charlie. Okay. <laughs> Um, I love Berlin, but if you go there, you've got to remember the Cold War and the Berlin Wall was kind of old news. We just had the 20th anniversary of it the other day. Half the people on the streets weren't even, uh, don't have any living memory of the, of the Cold War, you see. That's exciting history, but remember, these cities are looking forward, and we owe it to ourselves in our travels to spend a day in a big city, just seeing how it's getting stuff together, whether it's uh, Berlin or whether it's Paris or whether it's London. You know, when you think Paris, you probably don't think of La Défense but this is where people work. They don't work in a cute little shop on Rue Claire, you know? <laughs> that's, a that's a cute place to go, and I'll hang out in Rue Claire, but I would, I, I would think it's just in the interest of, like, honesty, it would be good to spend half a day out here 
seeing what it's like. I mean, the, the lunch I just had here was more America, I think, than a lunch I might have had on, uh, down on the wharf or something like that. So these are the reality checks we can give ourselves. Having said that, it then is okay, I think, to get into the cute medieval stuff. When you're going to spend a lot of time in the cute medieval stuff, know what you're looking at. It just behooves you to study a little bit ahead of time, uh, you know, and, and understand what's feudalism. I mean, this castle was made uh, 700 years ago when there were 300 independent countries in what is today Germany, each with its own weights and measures and crown jewels and curfew and dialect and, and, uh, and uh, walls, you see, put in a remote spot for defensive purposes. Now you go to that castle and it actually makes a little sense. And then you look at this castle and you realize this, this is not feudalism at all. This is romanticism. Uh, Neuschwanstein was built in the same generation as the Eiffel Tower when Germany was uniting. For five years I went to this castle and I thought it was medieval. It's pointy. <laughs> <coughs> now you guys are all smart enough to have a little better uh, 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 aggressive approach to getting prepared for your trip than just going and thinking pointy things are medieval. <laughs> um, the pointiest things are actually faux medieval built in the late 19th century when they were reassessing it, coming out of the French Revolution when everything was so cerebral, they wanted to get emotional again and underline their Christian medieval heritage, you see. So uh, it's an exciting thing to recognize that this is textbook romanticism. And when you understand romanticism, the ism of the 19th century, a 30-year sightseeing takes on some meaning. One of my favorite kinds of castles is a ruined castle. Here with a little imagination, you're under attack a thousand years ago in Portugal. What a wonderful place for a picnic. It's hard to find the ruined castles because they're free. And when something's free, nobody promotes it. Why should they? They're just rotting away unnoticed on hilltops from Finland to Portugal to Greece. Uh, it, it behooves you to get a little aggressive in your planning and find out where some of these places are. I recommend buying the best map you can over there in your travels and spend half a traffic jam just learning the key. Know what those little dirt roads are leading to. There's ruined castles everywhere that, are, that completely get missed by the tourism. There's a lot of great ancient sites, but just because something's BC does not mean it's got to be seen, all right? <laughs> There's mediocre BC stuff. Be select about your ancient stuff, and then the stuff you choose to see, see it with gusto, understand it. Here we have the most famous aqueduct in all of Europe, the Pont du Gard, southern France, uh, near uh, Avignon, you know. Um, it's not an aqueduct. It's the most scenic bridge of a 30-mile long aqueduct, you see built 2,000 years ago, engineered to bring water using gravity, losing about one inch every hundred yards, into the town of Nîmes. Imagine that. The Romans recognizing it's stupid to carry water when you can let gravity do it. Let's design something to dole out that, that force of gravity more sparingly. And imagine the jubilation on that day in Nîmes 2,000 years ago when water tumbled into that great city. Now with that little, the human, human aspect of it, and to understand what that was all about, all of a sudden visiting this bridge of the uh, uh, Pont du Gard in, in southern France, I think it's a little more rewarding. But not 10% of the American tourists that go there think about it enough to really be properly turned on by the site. I've got lots to get homesick for, but it is not an option when I'm in Europe. I've spent a quarter, a third of my adult life, four months a year in Europe, every year for the last 25 years or so, and when I'm there, I am really there. Psychologically, you want to be there. It's a trick. Some of us are really good at not being there. We've got all this technical stuff to keep us at home if we want to, you know. But when you're there, be there. For a lot of people, going to church is an important part of their, daily, their weekly routine. Can't go to church in Europe because you're far away from home. Wrong. You can go to church on Sunday. You can go to the greatest church in Christendom, St. Peter's, and take a flash photograph of Michelangelo's Pieta or go to Mass right at that high altar above the tomb of St. Peter's. Two different ways to experience that church. You can be in France during harvest time and you got these wiry, wonderful, photogenic grape pickers. You can get your zoom lens out and photograph them. Or you can stow your camera and get out there and pick grapes with them. Two different ways, dramatically different ways to experience that scene. Tonight in the little village grape harvest, wine, the uh, harvest festival, there's just grape pickers dancing and some of them are tourists too. You can be part of the scene in Europe, but you've got to make yourself be part of that scene. You'll be standing in wonderful markets. You probably have a wonderful farmer's market around here somewhere. Uh, every town in Europe's got one like that. And uh, as tourists, sometimes we feel gawky. We don't speak the language. We're not good with the metric system. We don't really know the coins. We just want to buy one apple and one carrot. There's a long line of, uh, of uh, intense people behind you that just want to do some serious business. And you get a sense that this merchant is not pleased to see you. Hold your ground. You're not a gawky tourist. You're one in a thousand-year-long line of hungry travelers who wants to buy an apple who doesn't speak the language. <laughs> okay? You're part of the scene. Give yourself that credit. It makes a huge difference. 
Art should be fun. If the art's not fun, you don't know enough about it. I know that from my own experience. For years I went to the museums because my mom said it would be a crime not to. <laughs> I was surrounded by other people looking like they were having fun and I was convinced they were faking it. <laughs> then I took an art history class and those museums were all together different experiences. Know the art. I wrote a book called uh, Europe 101, and, uh, which is the story of Europe from the pyramids to Picasso, and then another book called Mona Winks is self-guided tours to all the museums. Um, and uh, it's so much fun to be a tour guide. For 25 years I was a tour guide learning what people need to know and just as important what they don't need to know. If I study my passion for teaching over the last 30 years, it's evolved in an interesting way, kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, starting with the basic stuff and moving into more fulfilling and creative and so on. And uh, I, for the first decade it was Europe through the back door, budget tricks, you know, how do you catch the train, how do you pack light, how do you stay healthy. Next 10 years, in the 90s, I was teaching art and history and culture appreciation. That was Europe 101. And that makes, you don't go to Europe just to get a uh, reasonable bed. You go to Europe to enjoy the art and the culture. And then in the, in the last decade, I find myself teaching broadening your perspective through travel. And to me, that's the highest sort of thing, to come home with a broader perspective. And just last year, I wrote a book called uh, Travel as a Political Act, which um, has been a topic of a lot of talks that I give around the country, and it's online if you want to find it or anything. But uh, it's, you can get little senses of it in my talk today. But boy, when you travel, it is so exciting to keep those things in mind more than just how do you get a cheap hotel and a good meal. But um, how can you appreciate the art and the history and the culture and how it can broaden your perspective? When you're enjoying art, remember the most enjoyable art, I think, is to see it what they call in situ. Not in museum, but in situ, where the artist was paid to make it in that church or in that palace or on that square and understand it in its physical and historic context. Here we have a piece of art by Fra Angelico, the greatest painter of the high middle ages, who was one of the most spiritual guys you'll ever encounter in art history. For him, painting was a form of prayer. They said he couldn't paint a crucifix without weeping. And when he went, uh, he was working here in the monastery run by Savonarola. And Savonarola was the ranting, raving, austere monk that turned Florence into a theocracy kind of like a uh, Khomeini, I suppose, of the Renaissance. And he threw out the Medici, turned the place into a theocracy, and everybody was burning all their fleshy, decadent, hedonistic stuff. Even Botticelli was throwing some of his canvases on those fires as they made that city, you know, a theocracy. And uh, to be in there and to understand, to be in that monastery and understand the work of Savonarola and the work of Fra Angelico and to look at this, you see you're understanding it in a context. And then it, I think it becomes more rewarding and more interesting. All of us have quirky little personal interests, right? And when you're studying, everybody's going to see the Mona Lisa and the Leaning Tower and the Beef Eaters. But you really owe it to yourself to know if there is a little museum that hits your passion in your travels. There are museums for thimbles. There are museums for tattoos. There's chocolate museums. There's marijuana museums. There's beetle museums. There's museums filled with art done by people who were locked up because they were criminally insane. Uh, there's all sorts of fascinating museums. And they're really quite good but you need to take the initiative before you get there to find out if where they are and then plan that into your trip like you're your own tour guide. You want to see bones in Rome? Many people want to see bones in Rome and they go out to the catacombs. There's no bones in the catacombs of Rome. There are bones in the Capuchin Crypt right downtown and you'll see plenty of them there. I've been really into experiences lately. I think it's really important for Americans to have real Ex vibrant experiences, not just see a bunch of old stuff on walls and museums and galleries, but to go out there in the stadium and party with the local people and so on. And when I was in Ireland with my family, we wanted to make sure we had some of those experiences. And we went to the main stadium to go to a hurling match. Hurling is sort of the national pastime in Ireland, kind of like airborne hockey with no injury timeouts. It's a very fast and rugged game. <laughs> and uh, we were in this stadium with 50,000 Irish people. It occurred to me the streets were full of tourists, but there wasn't a single tourist in that whole stadium. It was just Irish people. We bought the right colored uh, banners and stuff and shawls, and we had to remember which team to root for or we'd get, or we'd get beat up. Um, our kids learned a lot of creative ways to swear, I'll tell you, by the end of that game. And uh, it was a rich experience, and no tourist in town took advantage of it. I mean, it's a clear example of how if you're a clever tour guide, you can maximize the experience. Um, I love nature, you probably do too. We got great natural wonders around here in the West Coast. The nice thing about Europe's natural wonders is they are so accessible. This woman looks pretty rugged, but I'll admit that I'm standing on the edge of a revolving restaurant to take the photograph. <laughs> <laughs> Filled with women in high heel shoes who rode the lift up for breakfast, okay? 
The point is all you need is $15 in a sunny day and you can get to the top of those lifts. And the beautiful news is that the traditional culture survives quite vividly in those high nooks and faraway corners. And your challenge is to get up there and find it. Good news is that you can hike or frolic <laughs> all the way across the Alps from, from, from France to Slovenia, never come out of the mountains in, in joining trails like this and every night sleep in a hut like this for $20 a night. I mean, it's, it's the fun irony is sometimes the better places you get, the less expensive they are. In so many cases, that's the way it is. Here we have a nature freunden hut, a nature friend's hut. And it's just, I could tell you all sorts of stories about this place, but it's just an amazing opportunity if you know how to get off the beaten path and make your trip uh, the trip that you really want and deserve. You need up-to-date information. If you have an old information uh, book on Rome, it will tell you about the Victor Emmanuel Monument. And it's, everybody agrees it's about the ugliest building in town. And it just dominates the center. It's built up there 100 years ago, you know, to placate the king. And uh, a new guidebook will tell you, you can take an elevator up to the top now and enjoy the very best view in all of Rome because you don't have to look at what you're standing on, the Victor <laughs> Emmanuel Monument. <laughs> and I, it's just a beauty. It's a, some of the best $10 you could spend in Italy right now is to get a view of Rome without that man, our Victor Emmanuel Monument by going up to that lift. Also, you need to have up-to-date information as Europe evolves. Of course, it's an exciting time in Europe with the unification and uh, the Cold War long gone and Eastern Europe kicking into gear and catching up with the West and so on. You go to Berlin, you find a city that's the hottest city in Europe. I mean, Berlin is really exciting. This is the new Capitol building in Berlin. Uh, it was sitting on a bombed-out hook of the Reichstag building that was right there in the Berlin Wall for, you know, all since World War II. And uh, in good European style, they didn't bulldoze it and build a new building when the government went from Bonn back to Berlin. They took the historic building, a blackened, bombed-out hulk, renovated it, incorporated modern architecture into that, this beautiful glass dome, and now you've got a powerful bit of uh, uh, ar architectural symbolism for the German people with their new government in Berlin. Glass dome, open free, open all the time free, designed mostly for Germans, but of course tourists are more than welcome, to go up that spiral ramp to the very top, and then you look down literally over the shoulders of your legislator to see what's going on in their desk. Powerful comment to those legislators that people are going to keep an eye on them now, right? So I was up there on opening week, on the very top of this beautiful new thing, surrounded by teary-eyed Germans. Anytime you're surrounded by teary-eyed Germans, <laughs> Something exceptional is going on, okay? <laughs> and it was clear to me this was a very emotional, exciting, uh, symbolic moment. The closing of an ugly chapter in the history of a great nation. No more division, no more communism, no more fascism. A new government, a united country, opening a new century with a new capital building, looking into a promising future. Wow, what a heady time to be up there. And I looked around and I saw most of the tourists who were Americans didn't have a clue. They were completely disconnected. And it just saddened me. I thought, I don't want to be in a dumbed-down society. And without drawing too much into this, I just really feel that there's powerful forces in our society that would find it convenient if we were all just dumbed down, and just go shopping and be mindless producer-consumers and so on. And I just sort of vowed in my own work as a travel writer to expect my readers and my viewers and my tourists to be engaged and to have an attention span and to care and to, and to want the whole story and to come back from their trip changed. And uh, you can too, but you've got to remember the system is going to try to want to dumb you down. Fun in the sun, frequent flyer miles, duty-free shopping, what's the power of your sunscreen, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> There's more important things to travel than duty-free shopping. I think you guys know that. But for the average American that just goes on vacation, it's not really travel. It's just a break, which is okay, but it's a lost opportunity. As Europe unites, of course, we've got most of the former Warsaw Pact country now part of Western, part of Europe. And... Uh, Overnight, a few years ago, 10 nations joined the EU and the geographical center of Europe shifted from Belgium to about the Czech Republic. Uh, and it's exciting. It's a heady time in Eastern Europe right now. I mean, when I first was going to Poland, people were taking their windshield wipers in with them at night. It was such a bleak economy, this clueless command economy with no sensitivity to the laws of supply and demand. Uh, somebody forgot to order windshield wipers. Thieves got wind of that. Steal windshield wipers and sell it for a fortune in the black market. That's what happens when you don't have the laws of supply and demand. Of course, now they got the laws of supply and demand. It's a festival of pent-up entrepreneurial spirit, and people are leaving their windshield wipers on at night <laughs> in Poland. <laughs> and when you travel around there, it is really fun. Uh, Prague is the gateway to Eastern Europe, and it's the, it's the greatest city, but they've got, you've got to do more than that. Prague is quite touristy now and quite expensive. I love it. It's the best beer in Europe for $2 a mug. Um, I just did a study on beer uh, quality versus price. It's perfectly inversely related. It's <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, and they had all this horrible time with communism and their dictators and everything, and now they've torn down all the statues, and rather than melt them down, they've gathered them in parks. So you go to these statue parks where you've got all these social realistic statues ranting and raving at each other <laughs> instead of the people. <laughs> And uh, it's just a fun time to be exploring Eastern Europe. If you want to spice up your trip, go to Turkey. I just can't say enough about Turkey. I absolutely love Turkey. Um, and it's changing really fast. I had a TV show out on Turkey that was about 10 years old, and I watched it a couple years ago. I thought, this is just wrong to have this show out. I need to update it. It's just uh, Istanbul is a new city. It's a city of 10 or 15 million people. They're drilling a tunnel now for the train between Asia and Europe under the Bosporus. Uh, and you walk through the streets of Turkey and you realize uh, it's so important for Americans to see a westward-facing, secular Muslim society. And Turkey's a great way to do that. Um, I think it's been 10 years since I flew in and out of the same city. Think cleverly about flying into one city and out of another city. Open jaws. It's no financial penalty. It's half the round trip fare from here to there, half the round trip fare from there to there. And then you don't have to return, spend the time and money to the needless return to your starting point. And then you're able to organize your trip in cultural, culture shock order. Start easy, work hard, all right? <laughs> it would make no sense to start in Istanbul and work your way back to London. London would be just a horrible anticlimax. You want to start in the mild countries, and mild means England, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love England. If you read my England guidebook, you see I, my enthusiasm for England, but go there first when cream teas and roundabouts are exotic. Then go to France, then go to Italy, then go to Greece and finish off with the flurry in Turkey. That would make a lot of sense. And you'd work up into Turkey. Added advantage of that, it's delaying places best for shopping till the end of your trip. I've given up trying to talk people out of shopping in their travels, but try not shopping for 80% of your trip. Finish in the more interesting, cheaper place and buy up everything there and fly home heavy. Another advantage of structuring your trip in the interest of minimizing culture shock till the end is it delays places most hazardous to your health until the end of your trip. Very clever. <laughs> Why get diarrhea early? Okay. <laughs> this is the main drag in Istanbul, and I'll tell you, it's, it's this crowded all day long and into the wee hours. They can't even run the trolley. It's got so many people on it. And just to be in that kind of vibrancy is exciting for me. I mentioned we have a tour program. It's, uh, it's the hottest thing in my business right now. We're, we're working very hard with the 70 or 80 of us up in Seattle at Europe through the back door. And last year we took, I think, well, that, we took 12,000 people last year. This year we're taking eight or 9,000 people because of the economy. Everybody's down about that much. So, you know, it's okay. I don't think, when people talk about the economy, I don't think we should have been as hot as we were. That was all the result of uh, goosing the economy. You can only goose something so long and pretty soon it stops responding, right? And uh, it stopped responding. So now we're back down to where it should be. That's my take on it, uh, if we're realistic. And we're fine with eight or 9,000 people. Uh, it's the most, I'm just so excited about the job that our guides are doing. And if you're curious about our tour program, our tour program is different than most because there's half as many tourists on the same big bus with a guide who is fully paid up front and cannot make another penny off you over the course of your trip. So there's no tips, no kickbacks on shopping, no s selling you sightseeing, it's all included. And uh, you got a guide who's on your side. And for some people that's just really appreciated and that's why m well over half of our travelers are people who've been with us before. We've got many people who've taken eight or 10 or 12 of our itineraries. Um, so uh, if you're curious about that, you can check out our itinerary on our website or in the brochure I handed out today. Uh, the big normal 50 people on a 50 seat tour bus is uh, I want to talk about it constructively because it can be a good value because they sell an impossible price. It can't be that cheap. It's no profit. They make their money off you once you get over there. They don't even pay their guide properly. The guide has to make money by keeping you in the dark and taking you shopping for kickbacks. Okay? Now, they're giving you transportation and hotels cheaper than you could buy it on your own. If you want to buy that shell, equip yourself with a guidebook and skip out of the stuff they, they want you to do, you could be just freeloading on the tour, just having like a bus pass that comes with Nice, comfortable, forgettable hotels filled with Americans you don't want to hang out with. <laughs> All right? And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. That could be a very efficient economic sort of beginning. Use it as a springboard to have your own adventure. If everybody did that, they'd have to change their business plan. But uh, you can certainly do that. Um, but these are people here that, that are probably in timeshare condos in southern Spain. And they've got one day in their life in uh, Morocco. Excuse me a sec here. They've got one day in their life in Morocco. And they're spending it with a, a bunch of other people from California. And um, here they are. They've done their little walk through town, had all the Kodak moments, and they're going to the restaurant in Tangier where every American tourist goes when they have one day in their life in Africa, to this little touristy restaurant. And there's a 
charming looking belly dancer, looks like Boy George. <laughs> um, and uh, I mean, think of the conversation going on at this table here. You know, that is to me such a failure for a traveler to put themselves into that kind of, all I could think was self-imposed hostage crisis, you know? <laughs> you can do Tangier on your own, so easy, but, no, but these people don't do it because they ask somebody in the industry, is this reasonable for me to do? And the industry, obviously, is wired to say, no, you're not capable of doing that. Take the tour. We'll make money off of you. So you're consumers. You can be more aggressive or less aggressive, but the choice is yours. I spent 25 years as a tour guide. I know what it's like. I know that the average tour guide needs to find, he's concerned not about where's the cute place for a rest stop, but where can I park the big bus and can 30 people go to the bathroom at the same time? You know, this is a great stop for a bus driver, but not for somebody who's interested in that culture. Many people get on these tours, and on day two, <laughs> it occurs to them, we could have done this on our own, uh, but it's too late now. And, and for a lot of people, they go over there, and th here's the standard experience. These people are in a cafeteria in Vienna listening to local musicians play the Strauss waltzes. I mean, it's in a, it used to be a palace. The advertising sounds really good. You know, you go to a palace for lunch, and you hear the local musicians play the Strauss waltzes. You get there, and you realize you're just part of this whole sort of mechanism for giving people canned culture. And most of these people go home and thought they had a good time. So who am I to say they didn't? I just think you can have a much more real experience and not spend any more money if you choose to. You can be a guest of honor at a Greek wedding festival if you can simply put 30 miles between you and the next hotel and be in a town with no postcards. You're staying in somebody's home, Domatia. Every country's got bed and breakfast. For, 20, for $30, you're staying upstairs uh, above the tavern, uh, and you learn how to play backgammon with the locals, and you're right there the next day for the, your guest of honor at the, at the wedding festival. That's real travel, and anybody can do it. So that's what I try to do with our guidebooks, is to uh, organize the uh, efficiency of all this information into the book so people can do their tours without having to wait with 50 other people and have a tour guide with a conflict of interest. I mentioned Europe Through the Back Door is the textbook for all of this kind of travel. I'm just skimming the chapter heads of that book today. And then we've got 30 different books on all the different parts of, uh, of Europe. And each region has its own sort of flying wedge of information with DVDs, phrase books, maps, city guides, and country guides. Uh, it's so fun for us to be updating these books. I think we're the only books out there that physically visit almost every place in the book every year. And that's just our formula for having a very good guidebook. And they're very driven by connecting people with people. I know the people who run the hotels and the restaurants, and they know us, and they know that they need to earn the business. Museums can, <laughs> museums can ruin a good vacation. <laughs> and you need to be sorting through that. Um, we try to do that in our art book. And one thing I've worked on really hard lately, which I'm just really excited about, is making my audio tours and then offering them for free on the internet through iTunes. And we've had a couple million people download our tours. They're the same tours in the book, but we've designed them so you can just have it in your ear and then just be lost in that site instead of having your eyes buried in a book. It is so cool for anybody with an MP3 or an iPod to be able to do that. And I like the idea of just having it free. And uh, we're doing a lot more of those. So we've got all of the essential sites covered absolutely free in London, Paris, Venice, Florence, and Rome. And uh, th that's a, a bigger and bigger part of our program. Our radio show has been a lot of fun lately. We're in 150 different cities every week for an hour, and uh, it's also one of the leading uh, um, podcasts. Uh, uh, it's a 55-minute hourly uh, show, and a lot of it is Europe, a lot of it's not. So if you're curious about that, we're working on a thing now where we deconstruct all those shows and then put them by topic so you can just type in Spain and then get a playlist of all the stuff we've ever done relating to Spain, and you can just travel with that. So when you're sitting on the train coming into Madrid, you can hear interviews and talk to people and so on. And with the radio, I get so much fun, interesting people to talk to. I was just talking to the princess of Norway. I got to ask her, what's it like to be like royalty in the 21st century and do you still marry your cousins and there you're all a little bit <laughs> deformed, you know? And uh, it's just things I always wanted to know that you can ask and then design it into a, a radio show. So it's all on our website there. Um, the internet is such a powerful tool for travelers. I just, I don't need to tell you guys that, but it's just so exciting what's going on. And I just tell people, I don't care uh, how unsavvy you are with this, you've got to get with it when it comes to using the cyber cafes or the, you know, the, the things that let you travel smarter in Europe using the internet. Uh, tourist information offices are available everywhere, and that's because the huge part of each economy is tourism. And they've got all sorts of information to help you organize your time well. One of my favorite things to take advantage of is local guided walks. 
These are usually done by retired school teachers or people that are just aficionados of their little town. If there's any tourism, if there's any history there, they'll have a guided walk organized by the tourist office for the public. Nice thing about that is you pay $15 each instead of $200 for the guide. And uh, it's organized by the tourist office. It becomes very affordable and uh, quite a, a nice thing to do. So all over Europe you'll find these guided walks. I think they're always time and money well spent. A new kind of tour is a bike tour, where you get bikes and a guide, and you cover more ground, get a little exercise, and it's a fun memory. Uh, but anywhere you're traveling, if you have a good local guide, I think it makes a difference. You do not have a burrow to carry your gear. You, <laughs> you need to pack light. These people are packing too heavy. When I go to Europe, I see people like this, I wonder, what do you need to have all these big, uh, burdensome bags, you know? Even young travelers, a lot of times, have just too much. Unless you're camping, don't pack like you're camping, okay? Um, you need to be mobile. These people got it right. 9 by 22 by 14 inches. That's as much as I allow myself on a trip. I've lived out of a carry-on the airplane size bag for a third of my adult life. If I had Sherpas, I would set them free. <laughs> it's not a hardship to pack light. It's a blessing to pack light. You just don't need that much stuff. Now, way beyond the scope of today's class, but these are very popular kind of bags that s double as a rucksack or a suitcase. A lot of people like to get wheels, the same sort of thing. It doesn't matter. Either way, if you want wheels, use wheels. It just costs you $50 extra, and you've got a few more pounds of gear. But it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing for a lot of people. As long as I'm able to carry it on the, my back personally, that's what I will do. This is one of our tours, and you can see here's our, here's our guide, Lisa, and she's got her... Uh, what's that? Yeah, right? <laughs> in, in Luca? Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow, you know that street. <laughs> That's some great. I've never had anybody burst out via Filunga. <laughs> what is it? Via Filunga. Ah. Well, Lisa here on Via Filunga is, uh, <laughs> is uh, traveling well. She's got her bag, and every day she goes to the bus or the train station uh, as a good traveler like that. Uh, this guy is packing like I would be with a bag on his back. Uh, is my son, he's strong enough to not even put it on his back, he just carries it that way, but these people are mobile, and the reality is, they don't show you this on the tour brochures, you know, but every day or every two days, you gotta pack up and carry it to the bus, or carry it to the train. A lot of walking with your gear, you wanna be mobile. Exactly what you put in there is covered in my Europe Through the Back Door book. People just wanna know exactly, I feel like kind of, uh, it doesn't really matter exactly how I pack, but they insist, so one time I just said, okay, I'll give it to them, I spread, <laughs> spread everything out on the bed in the hotel, there I was naked with my camera, just in <laughs> inventorying it. And, uh, you know, all, all the little details are covered <laughs> in the book. The language barrier for, for a whole generation, I've been saying it's not a big deal, and it's certainly not a big deal now. I, I always used to say, talk to somebody who's young, they're likely to speak English. Well, those young people are now in their 50s. And, uh, you know, it's just anybody who's educated in Europe, anybody who's in the tourist business, anybody who's in any kind of real serious business seems to speak English as a second language. We're lucky. We speak the language that works. If you meet a Greek hiking in the uh, Alps who meets a Norwegian, how do you think they'll communicate? Broken English. What Greek speaks Norwegian? <laughs> think about it. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> you're Norwegian. You want to have a bigger uh, world than four million people who speak your language? You're going to learn English. So we're the ones that are, are the uh, beneficiaries of that, assuming you're a monoglot. If you speak another language, that's great. But if you just speak English, don't let that inhibit where you can travel. You remember, you got signs that are multilingual, and uh, you can make educated guesses. <laughs> if you're not feeling well in Denmark, and you see a sign with a red cross on it pointing to Central Sick House. <laughs> can you read that? Well, go get fixed up. It's impressive to me how many Americans would bleed to death in the street corner looking for the word hospital. I've never looked up any of these words, but I make educated guesses. You gotta, it's not multiple, it's not answers out of the blue, you know, it's, it's an easy educated guess, multiple choice kind of thing. For instance, you look at this sign and it's, you don't say what on earth is that, you say what could it be? These are hours, so this could only be hours, it could only be open times or closed times, that's what they're telling you. So you think about what would they be advertising, they're advertising open times. Vum, from, vum, if it rhymes, go for it. <laughs> the 4th of July. On the left, you see six words, most of which end in tog. First one, Monday. Mo good. We mit mitvok, midweek, Wednesday. Uh, tog, uh, like a guten tog, right? Soup of the tog. There's a lot of togs you'll encounter. Um, it's open from 9 to 11, und from 4 to 6. Anything over 12, subtract 12 and add p.m. 
at the risk of insulting my travel, my students, I just make a real point. You know, get this 24-hour clock. There's a lot of people been over through two weeks. They still go giddy every time it goes over 12. You know, so um, <laughs> 16 minus 12 is 4 p.m. On Wednesday afternoon, something different happens. Okay, there's there's only there's only two possibilities: open or closed. Everything else is open. This is different. With all the confidence in the world, you can tell your friends, hey, on Wednesdays on Mittag, after Mittag, nach Mittag, it's geschlossen. All right. <laughs> if there's two thieves in town, you're going to meet them, you know, because thieves target Americans. Not because they're mean, but because they're smart. If I was a street thief in Europe, I'd specialize in Americans. <laughs> I'd have a little card that says, Yanks are us. <laughs> We're the people with all the good stuff in our purses and wallets. So leave your valuables at home or in the hotel room or time under your waist, uh, tucked in like a shirt tail, in a money belt. Very, very important. Uh, it's not dangerous over there. It's just petty theft. Nobody's getting knifed and mugged, all right? Beggars are all over the place, and you're going to see them because you're out in the streets, and they target the tourist attractions and so on. Beggars are not beggars. That's their front. They are pickpockets. When you know that, and if you're wearing a money belt, it's no big scary deal. In fact, if you know beggars are actually pickpockets and you're wearing a money belt, having a gypsy's hand slip slowly into your pocket is just one more interesting cultural experience. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, several times, a stranger's hand slips slowly into my pocket. <laughs> and I just leave them there. They think I'm dead. <laughs> um, terrorism, I'll just tell you in a nutshell, terrorism is overrated. And I think you should tell all your friends that. And every time Americans freak out because of something like this, to get a grip, all right? We are 300 million people. We're 4% of this planet. We spend as much as everybody else put together on our military, and even Obama cannot get elected without promising more. We got military bases in 140 countries. Only the United States of America can declare somebody else's natural resources on the other side of the planet, quote, vital to our national security interests. <laughs> At least those poor people would prefer it if we were honest enough to say vital to our accustomed material lifestyle. Half of the world's trying to live on $2 a day. That's not a liberal or a conservative thing, that's just a fact. The average lot in women on this planet is to walk for water every day. A billion people are trying to live on one dollar a day. When the United Nations get together to try to deal with a problem that matters to the desperately poor half of humanity, routinely our country is outvoted 140 to 4. Who stands with us on issues of child labor law, water, third world debt relief, landmines and this kind of thing? Who stands with us? Israel, Marshall Islands and Micronesia. That's the coalition of the compassionate caring ones. Now that doesn't matter what I think, that's what the other 96 of humanity, percent of humanity thinks if they know, if they're at all engaged. They look at us like an empire because we act like an empire. We don't like to think of ourselves as an empire, but you know, it doesn't really matter. So are there going to be disgruntled people at the fringes of an empire? Have there ever been an empire that didn't have disgruntled people at the fringes? The empire gets to call them whatever they want. Barbarians, anarchists, terrorists, whatever. I mean, it's so easy to condemn people if they're terrorists. Somebody doesn't like our oil plant in Nigeria, they're terrorists if they disagree with us. You know, they're just terrorists. And we all go, amen, kill them. So we've got some interesting challenges to deal with. We're making some progress. But there's always going to be terrorism, and there always will be terrorism, and Norway will not be targeted. <laughs> now, tomorrow, if an American is beheaded by a jihadist in Madrid, it doesn't matter. It's one person. You know, I mean, 300,000 people, well, you know the story. I mean, every, every week 100,000 kids die because nobody's got any money for inoculations. Uh, if you cared about people, there's plenty of things we could do. So we just got to remember, if you really hate terrorism, the best thing we can do is travel, learn about the world, come home and help our country fit better into this planet, and to realize that the worst thing we can do if there is a terrorist event is to be terrorized by it. England, as a matter of principle, does not let the terrorists terrorize them. And it's quite effective. We, as a matter of principle, freak out every time there's a terrorist event. <laughs> and that's exactly what terrorists want to happen. They will send the video clips for our people to air. And we do. And then we all clench our fists and try to hit them. So it's a real weird thing going on. And we've got to start standing up and, and uh, get a, getting a grip on this with the media that can make so much problem this way with a general electorate here that uh, has a tough time understanding this sort of thing. Don't let terrorism stop you from traveling. Terrorism is a good reason to travel. And if you want to be statistical about it, anybody knows you're safer in Europe than you are here. 
We lose 15,000 people a year to handguns on our streets. Europe loses one-eighth of that because they don't have guns like we do. Europeans laugh out loud when they hear that Americans are staying home for safety reasons. If you care about your loved ones, you will take them to Europe tomorrow, for God's sake. <laughs> this is how I sell tours. <laughs> the Stop USA stuff, whenever you see that, and you don't see anywhere near much of it now as you did a couple years ago, but uh, it's not anti you or me, it's anti American war, anti American trade policy, anti American that kind of stuff. They love the ideals of America and they love Americans and they're thankful for what we've done in the past. And that's good news. You do not need to wear a Canadian flag. <laughs> I just took a thousand people to France, asked each one of them in a survey, how were you treated by the locals? Nobody complained, you know. It's just exciting to be over there and they're happy we care. Okay, Europe's uniting, 300 million people with a one big free trade zone now, 300 million people with the same coins in their pockets. The key for changing money, ATM. I've changed my last traveler's check, that's for sure. Europe is getting more and more automated. And if you're not comfortable with machines, you will stand in line and, and get lousy service and pay a premium for it. Anybody who has to stand in line to buy something in Europe can do it, but it's the last priority for them. And the people get disgruntled about it. And they're the root of their own problem because they refuse to use the machines. I'm pretty slow when it comes to using machines. I'd rather p give money to a real person at a window. But that's becoming more and more expensive in Europe. And you just got to get hit with the machines. Europe is deregulated from a flying point of view. Nowadays, you fly anywhere cheaper than taking the train. Uh, so before you buy a long tra train ticket or bus ride, drop into a travel agency or go online and figure out what the deal is for the best uh, budget flight. Europe has an internal Marshall Plan, investing in their infrastructure like we cannot imagine. It's a bugaboo for me because every time I go to update my book, the driving time is shorter <laughs> and I have to rewrite it. I mean, there's new bridges, there's new tunnels, more important than ever to realize if you want to smell the roses, you've got to get off the Autobahn and onto those small roads. Um, when I really uh, talk about packing light, I'll tell you some people just don't want to pack light and then I say you should rent a car. You can even rent a trailer, okay? Um, <laughs> But if you're going to be going by train, that's where it's really important to pack light. By car, you can put everything in the trunk and drive from door to door to where you want to go. It's quite nice. Europe is small, and it's smaller by rail. Uh, and Europe is investing itself now where you've got these super bullet trains all over the place. This is the new, grandest, most powerful, exciting train station in Europe in Berlin. The Hauptbahnhof, major train lines coming together at different levels at right angles. And uh, it's just breathtaking to be in Europe these days and see these bullet trains and to use them. Just recently I was in Munich at the train station and I was taking pictures of trains coming into the station, specifically birds, little cute little birds squished onto the windshield of the trains. And my first thought when I thought, saw that little bird was, you'd wait all your life to see a bird squished to the windshield of a train where I come from, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, it's not very nice, but uh, if, you're, if you're a slow bird, avoid those shiny parallel rails on the earth there, you know? Uh, uh, it's just fast on those trains. <laughs> and uh, things are synchronized. I mean, if there's two trains a day coming into this little village on the fjord, there will be two boats a day leaving. And you'll have just enough time to get a cup of coffee, get on the boat and carry on. All over Europe. Except in Italy, where the train comes in just in time to see the boat pulling out. <laughs> you, c you can count on that synchronicity, all right? Now, um, the big question for consumers is, if you're on a budget, are you going to go first class or second class? Uh, second class is four seats across and more crowded. First class is three seats across, less crowded. Uh, they cost 50% more per kilometer to go first class instead of second class. If I want to get something done, if I just want to be quiet and luxurious and I've got some extra money, it's nice to go first class. But if you're concerned about transportation, nearly every train in Europe has both first and second class cars on them going precisely the same speed, all right? <laughs> So uh, the best deal, I would say, is second class. Any night you spend on the train, you save a whole day on the itinerary uh, by sitting there all day. And I, I love sleeping on the train. And for $25 or $30, you get a couchette, a door that locks, and a tenant that takes care, care of your passport. And it works really well. We sell a lot of your rail passes at Europe through the back door. If you're curious about any of the year rail stuff, we are happy to help you out on that. I'm going to go pretty quick here because uh, I don't even, I think I'm running out of time. But uh, actually, let me check. What, what, time, what time is it? Is it 10 minutes to 2? 10 to 2. Okay, so I'm going to go. This can be like movies. Um, 
Use the public transportation. I just love Europe's public transportation. Uh, when it comes to eating, uh, you really, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to be attracted to the biggest neon sign that brags, we speak English and accept visa cards. You want somebody who loves their work, who's got a low rent kind of place away from the tourist crowds, with a small menu in one language that's handwritten. Small, because they're not uh, catering to people who want a huge choice. Uh, it, handwritten because it changes every day according to what's fresh in the market. And in one language because their passion is for feeding local people well. They're well happy to have tourists there, but when you see that one language menu, it's small, changing all the time, and you take one look and you see a local crowd of happy people, you know it's a good value. So that would be a good restaurant right here in, in downtown Rome. You can go to you know, self-service cafeterias in any department store and eat cheap with the locals. Um, you can go to bus stations and eat bad and cheap with the locals. There's just plenty of ways you can eat cheap. Europeans are feeling the crunch just like we are, and you find a lot of, Europe, a lot of Germans sharing their bratwurst and kraut and a beer. You know, it's just uh, everybody's on a tight budget, it seems like, and uh, more people are just ordering water and sharing dessert and so on. So if your budget requires that, you can do that and people will understand. Lots of good food for immigrant labor. Uh, all over Europe they've got uh, you know, immigrant labor just like we do in the United States and wonderful food for that budget level. And I'm a big fan of Turkish food when I'm in Germany, for instance. Every place in Europe has the daily special, the blue plate special, the Doggins Rat, the Plat du Jour, uh, Pub Grub, uh, the pre-dinner, the pre-theater dinner and so on, where for $15 you get a good hot meal. This is Stockholm, downtown, the old part of town. It's $10 for a lunch with a salad, bread, and a drink. Uh, Stockholm's famously expensive, $10 for lunch with a drink. That's not too bad, 2009. And then you save enough money to dine out and spend 50 bucks every two or three nights, you know? It just depends on your budget. No matter how tight your budget is, you owe it yourself to get out there and splurge a few times. Um, learn how to say, you know, three spoons, please, uh, you know? <laughs> Uh, picnicking is your budget mainstay. It's hard to spend much money picnicking, and I just love the quality of the food. This, the, uh, this would be for more than one person, but I'm talking, <laughs> I'm talking per person cost. If there's just you yeah, and your partner, this is a quick dashboard lunch between Castles and Wales. It's hearty, it's nutritious, it's fast, it's cheap, and you're going to relax and dine that evening. Uh, my son was just in Rome for a semester, and he taught me how cheaply you can live even in a very expensive city if you're away from the tourists. You know, that's the big trick. You're going to spend double for your coffee if you're within any sight of any tourist attraction. Uh, I want to talk just for a sec about budget hotels. <laughs> and I'm glad I got the help of slides here because a lot of people th think I'm talking about this. I'm not talking about this at all. This is turkey, $3 for the double, barely worth it, actually. Um, but there are, uh, there are lousy hotels in Europe you know, non-government regulated flop houses where for $25 you get a bed and a kitten tossed in for no extra. <laughs> and I'm not talking about these either. What I'm talking about is an alternative to this. This is what defeats people. This is what people are spending three or $400 a night on, running out of money, early, flying home, shaking their heads, thinking, my goodness, how can people afford to travel in this crazy day and age? Well, they're buying into that intercontinental category. If you want to go local, there are guest houses, there are B&Bs, there are Zimmers, there are all sorts of fun pensions where you are for $80 or $100 enjoying a great double, including breakfast. You just got to know where to go. I mean, Francoise here runs a wonderful little two-star hotel, less than $100 next year, downtown Paris on a pedestrian-only street, seven blocks from the Eiffel Tower, a market, a, a, just a pedestrian market right in front of her hotel. You step out in the morning, you feel like you must have been a poodle in a previous life. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing on Rue Claire if you want to have that. Um, smoking's no longer a, a, a big deal in Europe because smokers die younger. <laughs> it's that simple. There's no more smokers over there. And uh, they don't let you smoke in the pubs or anything like that. So a lot of people used to love the pubs but hate the smoke. Now you can love the pubs and not have smoky clothes when you leave there. Uh, the big deal about having a toilet in your room is no longer an issue because almost every room in Europe has been gutted and, and retrofitted with a little yacht-type head. So you're going to get a decent toilet and shower in your room. If you find a room without a toilet and shower, you'll save quite a bit of money. Most people want to spend 30 bucks extra a night to have that convenience. B&Bs. Every country's got B&Bs. You just got to know where to look. This woman runs a beautiful place in Florence. I just love to stay with her. Seven or eighty dollars for a double and Mama Rabati is your host, you know. Uh, this is uh, Kathleen Farrell who runs a little place in the west coast of Ireland and she's just so excited that Ricky from Seattle is here. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, she says, now you be back by 8 o'clock because Danny and his band are playing Irish folk music tonight at the pub. I mean, she's excited about your visit. And that's the beautiful thing, the sort of uh, irony of spending less and getting more because you're staying in somebody's home who's excited about your visit. 
Um, if you're traveling with a family, the more people you pack into the room, the cheaper it gets. That's kind of common sense. And uh, youth hosteling is open to anybody. Europe has thousands of youth hostels. There are new institutional high-rise hostels offering institutional kind of beds like this one in Copenhagen, which is a huge saving compared to hotels. And it's, uh, again, it's open to absolutely anybody. Uh, and uh, they're very good sources of information where you can rent bicycles or team up for this or that and cook together in the member's kitchen and so on. A lot of people think, youth hosteling, can I still do that? Well, um, these people are youth hostlers and uh, <laughs> uh, they took youth out of the name of the system. If you're over 55, you get a discount on the membership card, okay? So if you're alive, you are young enough to hostel. <laughs> There's no age limit for this kind of travel. Uh, you do have to be a good walker. If you're wondering, is this a uh, little uh, demanding for me physically or anything like that, I would say the most grueling thing about European travel is the heat and the crowds of summer. Uh, do yourself a favor and go in shoulders time, you know, uh, April, October, a beautiful time to go. In Europe they say there's no bad weather, just inappropriate clothing, okay? <laughs> so dress for the weather and you should be fine. It's crowded with people who live there, it's crowded with all of us who hustle in every year. F far as I'm concerned, there's two IQs of European travelers, those who wait in lines and those who don't wait in lines. If you're waiting in line, you're messing up. You may be a great computer software designer, but you just are screwing up because you don't know how to get into the Colosseum without waiting for two hours to get your ticket. This line is not waiting to get into the Colosseum. It's waiting to buy a ticket to get into the Colosseum. All over Europe, the lines are to get tickets, not to get in. And there's lots of alternative ways to get tickets. And that's your challenge, is to find those out. The Colosseum ticket also includes the Palatine Hill. A lot of times, a site nobody wants to go to is paired with a site everybody wants to go to so they can make you buy entrance to both of them. That's a way to raise prices and, and, and encourage people to go to the site nobody wants to see. The good news is you can go to the site nobody wants to see, buy the ticket there, and walk by all these people. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll save an hour of your time in Rome and not get the sunburn by standing out in line all day. This is a huge line to get into the Versailles Palace in Paris. Now, if you're, I mean, so many people, it's Tuesday, all the museums are closed, what should we do? Let's go out to Versailles, it's open. Not a unique brainstorm. Any guidebook recommends you avoid Versailles on Tuesday. The average tourist does not get around to reading their guidebook until they're about right there in the line. <laughs> and then they realize, oh, we should have gone on Monday. <laughs> if you arrive any day of the week but Tuesday, late in the day, you can be waltzing all alone with your favorite travel partner in the Hall of Mirrors. That's good news. And uh, more and more important sites are letting you make appointments in advance so that you can just walk right up and go in. That's the beautiful thing about internet combining with your travels. Or you have the option of just simply going where there are no tourists. I spent four months last year traveling and probably two months of the time there were not a, not a hint of a crowd anywhere and I was having a great time. Go to an island in Greece you can't even name. There's always enough commerce there. You can play backgammon with this guy. You'll never forget that game and I'm sure he never has forgot that game either, all right? <laughs> You need to be an extrovert if you see four cute guys sitting on a bench. <laughs> ask them to scoot over. Okay. <laughs> I've been saying this for 25 years and it works great. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of fun making our TV show over the years. I know it runs here in KTEC, is that the channel, the public television center? KTEH, that's right, KTEH and KQED, and I uh, appreciate you uh, staying tuned to that. We've got uh, a lot of uh, great shows in the works right now. I'm very excited about uh, what we're able to do through public television, and uh, my crew just worked so hard to, to put some good stuff together. It's fun as a tour guide and a TV producer to be able to pack all that into the DVDs now where we can have all of our shows in one uh, quite affordable anthology. Our tour program is just uh, something we're very proud of. Uh, beautiful, big, comfortable buses, great drivers, and small groups. Uh, groups that are like-minded because of the way we promote our tours, it makes the kind of people that take our tours actually fun to hang out with. So if you want the economy and efficiency of organized travel without the downside of organized travel, look around and consider our company and I think you'll find that it is, uh, when all the dust settles, it's, uh, if your time's worth a lot, it's really, you're going to experience probably 30% more per day without the downside of organized travel. Uh, I, when I go on a vacation, I get a deal, but I take my own tours, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. This is a, my wife and I on our Greece tour recently. Our guides make the art fun, and we know local guides that you've seen on our TV shows that really tell the story in a vivid, intimate kind of way. Uh, this is our first tour that we're doing way back in the 70s, and today we've got tours all over Europe. So uh, it's really a fun, fun sort of work to be in, and you can learn more about that on our website or in the material that we passed out. My passion is for people to do it on their own, Anybody who wants to do it on their own certainly can, 
my confidence is based on feedback I get from people whose grandchildren said you shouldn't be doing this, or where they're having the time of their life coming back with money in the bank for next summer's trip. If you want to travel this way, the key is to equip yourself with good information and expect yourself to travel smart, and then you can be your own tour guide. That's what we do at Europe Through the Back Door. This is my gang up in Seattle. And uh, Europe is better designed than ever. Now carve your wooden shoe. You can go to those art museums now with great high-tech sort of information on the different uh, uh, teaching devices. The traditional culture survives vividly if you know where to find it. That's the good news. Even in this modern uh, day and age, you can be up there in Switzerland on the right day when the, when the goats are brought through the town. You can find yourself on those wonderful far corners and, and gorgeous backdoor sites that make Europe such a magical place to uh, visit. All right, thank you very much. Happy travels. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you. And I got to say for everybody that enjoys the work you guys do here, it's really a thrill for me just as a consumer of Google stuff to uh, be able to be here and see what this is. And, and thank you for that. Do I have time for questions, Winnie? Is, is, is okay. So if, uh, if you got to go, um, you're going to miss out on a lot of important information. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so whoever has questions, if you guys could come up here to the mic. Sorry. Sorry, I'm dragging the cord around you. Okay, question, yeah. Um, I've watched... Um, all of your programs, and um, I always wonder when are you going to plan to travel to Russia? Uh, St. Petersburg, Golden Gate, um, Ring Around the Moscow would be fantastic sites for you to explore it, the rest of us. The question is, when am I going to go to Russia? As soon as Russia learns how to welcome tourists with uh, uh, no visa and a better, well-organized fare system for hotels. I love going to Russia. It's beautiful to go there. Uh, St. Petersburg is one of my, my favorite cities, really. And um, we take our tours there with Helsinki and Estonia. But it's, um, Ru Russia's going to warm up to that, and I think it's great for people to go to Russia, but from a mass tourism point of view, it's still, um, I just, I'm not convinced that the infrastructure is there with a uh, sort of a, a, a price for locals that's not gouging them, and the, the visa thing is frustrating to me. But it's, it's a, obviously it's going to happen, and it's very exciting. As soon as Russia's open up to tourism more, I'm going to make a TV show there for, for sure. Next. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, yeah. You mentioned uh, Europe as a new modern place, and uh, Berlin, obviously, uh, is very modern. Uh, so I like to see things like architecture and new cities and things like that. So are there any highlights that you would mention? Well, I love um, skyscrapers and modern cities, like I showed three slides there. And uh, I, I've found that in many cities, they, they protect the skyline in the downtown core because they don't want archi modern architecture obliterating beautiful domes and historic spires. Outside of that protected area, that's where you get the Manhattan. And I think it's really important when you're a tourist to find out where are the people working? Where's the real work-a-day life? And take the commuter train out there and wander through just the, the modern skyscraper Manhattan kind of areas because there's lots of modern art there. There's beautiful skyscraper architecture, and there's a vibrancy you don't, you don't feel in the touristic old core. Yeah. But, uh, man, there's great modern architecture all over Europe these days. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, I found, I found lots of really nice places in Europe, and I live in constant terror that you will one day put them in one of your books, and they'll be ruined <laughs> for me. <laughs> if I give you my email address, maybe you can send me a list, and I'll <laughs> I promise I won't put them in anything. <laughs> so, so, I mean, seriously, you know, I, I myself worry when I write up a place on my blog. Yeah. Uh, you know, how do you reconcile the, well, you know, this is a cool place, I like to tell people about it, and, but, you right. know, it, it definitely cannot tolerate 200 visitors a day. Right. Well, that's a very good question, and it's an issue that I, I do think about. <laughs> I go back to my favorite places. I don't know if you know the Cinque Terre, for instance, this little village, or five villages in the Italian Riviera. Every time I go there, I'm a little nervous because it gets more and more touristy, you know, and uh, all of a sudden, nobody's, make, nobody's picking the grapes anymore. All the grape uh, fields are just going to waste, and everybody's got their cyber cafes and their laundromats and their little boutique uh, hotels and so on. And I come into town every year or two, and local people are thrilled to see me because I'm stoking their economy. The tourists are just having a blast, 
And then there's always a few people like you that think I should have kept it a secret. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not, my job is not to protect these places. I'm sort of like the hired hand to find them. And what I would say is there are places I find that could not handle the crowds, and I would never promote a place that really didn't welcome the crowds or couldn't handle the crowds. And what I need to do is try to find more places so I can spread the crowds out a little bit. But it's, it's an interesting issue, and it's a nice problem for a travel writer to have, to have that much of an impact on a place. I wish I could find more Cinque Terres, and I wish I could find more Gimmelwalds. There are more Cinque Terres, but they're not as accessible as the Cinque Terre that, that I've been pushing, because it's just two hours away from Florence or the Leaning Tower of Pisa, where everybody goes anyways. If you go down to the Party Islands or down around Sicily, you can find a lot of places just about as magical, but, but they're, they're different. So I'm just, um, yeah, it's just, uh, I'm just doing my best to ruin these places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last year I was in uh, Muran at Chalet Fontana, one of the places mentioned oh in yeah. the book. It was completely swamped of English speakers. Yeah. Uh, a couple of months later, I went to the other side of the Bernese overland. Everybody was German. Everybody yeah. Oh, oh that's know. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Did you meet Denise there at Chalet Fontana? <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah, she's the wonderful lady that runs yeah. that. Um, you know, Americans go to the same places, and the Germans go to the same places, uh, and uh, people with my book go to the same places. It's just a reality. And I, 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 rem I remind people, um, if you want to not see Americans, you're holding the wrong book. <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to spread it out. Now, having said that, we've been talking about the marquee destinations. Honestly, I just spent 10 days in Basque Country and Galatia, northwestern Spain, and I, wor I write about it enthusiastically. And in 10 days, I probably saw 10 people with my book. I just spent 20 days across Scandinavia, and in 20 days, maybe I saw 100 people with my book. And then I go to Rome, and in one day, I see 300 people with my book. So. It's really interesting. We all are inclined to go to the same marquee destinations, but if you want to go to Estonia, you're going to find a backdoor wonderland, and you've got all the information. If you like my information, you'll have it, because I cover it, but Americans don't go there. Um, if I just wrote books on places that sold well, I would drop my Scandinavia book, and I wouldn't be covering Galatia. You know? So I have to be realistic. I'm a business, and I'm not going to write a book to Moldavia, uh, just because it'd be very expensive to do, and it would change really fast, and nobody would, relative, in relative terms, nobody would go there. I wrote a book once to the former Soviet Union, and it sold in the hundreds. You know, you've got to be tuned in to write, I'd, I'd write a book to Paris, and, it's, and it, it subsidizes all those other books. So that's just an interesting little uh, business thing I have to consider. Yeah. With the growing popularity of the automated machines for tickets and so on, but a lot of them only take chip and pin cards. Is right. there any movement on being able f for Americans to be able to get one of those? You know, that's a good issue, and I, I'm, not, I'm not very, uh, I don't have much of an appetite to learn about that. I, I've got a, a graffiti wall on my website. It's our version of Lonely Planet says the thorn bush or something like that. And uh, I, I asked the perplexing questions like that, and I let everybody who's got experience share their information. If you went to the ricksteves.com graffiti wall and, and look in there under technical challenges or credit, credit card issues or whatever, you'd find a lot of people talking about that. But that is a frustration for a lot of Americans is that Europeans have a little chip embedded in their card that makes our card not work. You can always use our card to get cash. And I almost exclusively get my, I use my ATM card to get hard cash and I spend hard cash. I find that's the, the best deal. But it, there, are, there is a frustration about that and I hope that that gets straightened out. I'm sure there's people working on it, but I just, I don't choose to get into it. Yeah. So I've personally experienced problems with trying to plan with others. Um, and there's a, a lot of people who either experience a lot of anxiety about, say, going off the beaten path or not doing tour relay groups or even doing something like staying at a two-star hotel, they, they are very much focused on the main tourist areas. Do you have any suggestions for people who want to travel with others um, on convincing you know, the people they want to travel with to sort of take this more holistic view and really spend, you know, instead of visiting four yep. countries in two weeks, you know, so spend you've got some time really getting to know a place. You've got friends who are front door travelers and you're a back door traveler. That's well, they're first time travelers, so yeah. they have a lot of anxiety about being a back door traveler. Anxiety because they're going to be physically roughing it or because they're going to places that aren't featured in Condé Nast? Anxiety because uh, they have no past expectations. For example, they don't realize how easy it is to find an English speaker in Western Europe, that, or the yeah. fact that you can often well, think it Well, it sounds it like out. they need to be 
drugged and dragged over there and then <laughs> introduced to it so that they realize that their fears Stage and Stage one complete, but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, once More they, ideas, did, I once they did one trip, they'd be fine. If, if you went to, if you, you know, if you, if, if, I don't know, if, if you go to my website and look at some of the uh, chatter of people who have, have traveled there, if you go to my tour section and see the um, online scrapbooks that people have made, you can see how there's real normal travelers that are inclined to take normal tours that have been found their way into this and they really have their apprehensions overcome by their own experience. But um, some people you can't force to be backdoor travelers and that's probably good news for the rest of us who are backdoor travelers. Thank you. So, so don't work too hard on it, please. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I don't actually have a question for you, Rick, but I just wanted to tell everyone here that you're going to stick around for a few minutes mm -hmm. um, to do autographs. So for people who are interested in that, um, please start lining up at the front. Oh, my God, that's everyone. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. It's fun to be here.